All right. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Looks like we have um, a good number of you coming in now. Um, thank you so much for your attendance. It's what is sure to be an illuminating and engaging discussion, which was organized by Professor, a Professor Amy Krollinger of the School of History, Philosophy, and Religious Studies at Oregon State University and moderated by Professor Steve Shea. So today, uh, five experts will spark a participatory dialogue about the history and present of voting rights and restrictions in the United States. Uh, they may also speculate on the future of this critical issue. Um, I'm the director of this school and proud to support our consistent and challenging um, record of highly responsive flash panels. So we've organized these events for approximately five years on an ad hoc basis. Uh, whenever we want to respond as scholars to current events, when we believe academic expertise can help clarify contentious topics, or at the very least um, provoke some thought. Our professors do this outreach as part of our commitment to our school mission, um, which I'll take a moment to read to you uh, quickly before I turn the screen over to Professor Shea and our distinguished um, speakers. So this is our school mission. Um, that we uh, worked on a while back. Uh, we in the School of History, Philosophy and Religious Studies um, empower our students and community members with the knowledge and skills to engage in broad public debate and enrich public discourse. We inspire the pursuit of evidence-based analysis, critical empathy and appreciation of the multiple perspectives, complexities and contingencies in the world around us. So thank you again for logging into this event and please enjoy the presentations and discussions. And I'll turn it over to you, um, Steve. Thank you, Nicole. I'm Steve Shea of the School of History, Philosophy and Religion at Oregon State. We should remember during panels like this that Oregon State University is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River Band of the Kayapuya. Following the Willamette Treaty of 1855, the Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of those people are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Salitz Indians. We are very grateful to have a panel of experts who have volunteered to share their insights with us today. They represent the fields of history, and political science from our nation's finest institutions, as you will hear when I introduce each panelist before their presentation. The panelists will offer about 10 minutes or so of commentary, and then we'll have time for people to pose questions to them. If you, you have a question that you would like to ask, please click on the Q&A and type in your question that will be shared with the panelists. Finally, I'd like to thank those who have made this panel possible. Uh, starting with the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, and especially to Amy Kohlinger for arranging and orienting the session. Uh, Dean Larry Rogers, uh, also uh, thank you very much, and Natalia Bueno and Aaron Sneller for their support and assistance. With that, I'd like to introduce our first panelists. Adrian Jones is an Assistant Professor of Political Science at Morehouse College. Dr. Jones's research focuses broadly on the history and politics of Black Americans and legal issues related to the Black experience. In particular, she has studied the 1965 Voting Rights Act and the reaction of the conservative community into the present day. Her recent work is focused on Supreme Court jurisprudence related to the Voting Rights Act, and she is a regular opinion editor writer on issues of race and politics. Welcome, Dr. Jones. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> um, I figured that since the title of this presentation was Jim Crow 2.0, and I have found recently that I have been asked regularly whether or not I think that Jim Crow 2.0 is an appropriate name for the phenomenon that we are seeing now, I thought I would give my opinion about why I do in fact think um, that this is a Jim Crow 2.0 kind of a situation. So um, I'm going to assume that most people generally understand what Jim Crow is. And so, um, you know, you know that it is based on untruths, right? This idea that uh, Black people are not equal in the United States and should not be treated as citizens. And um, the Jim Crow package of laws was 
both reactionary and intentional, right? So you are coming out of the reconstruction and this very tiny progressive period um, into a period where we're going to revitalize the sort of the more of the social structure of slavery, where we aren't going to allow people to vote. So we're going to use mechanisms like poll taxes, which um, are designed, all of these methods, I think, are designed um, with thought into what is going to make it difficult for Black people during Jim, this what becomes the Jim Crow period to vote. So poll taxes for people who um, are not economically secure and will probably have difficulty paying those poll taxes. We're talking about literacy tests and understanding tests for people who are have been uh, denied the opportunity to have education, um, you know, across the broad breadth of the uh, population that we're talking about grandfather clauses that prevent you from voting if your grandfather couldn't vote when your grandfather was a slave. And so obviously you're, you are not going to be qualified to vote. Uh, violence like lynching. Um, and I also consider this to be just general social threat and violence um, of the kind that we're talking about today with uh, the police issues that we've been having. Um, and also what I call economic violence, this idea that you might live in a place like I live in Georgia, um, we have um, a significant rural population in Georgia, so you're living in a rural community, you go down to your local courthouse uh, to register or to attempt to vote, and this is going to mean that you're going to know the people in your community, and they're probably going to put, uh, it's going to threaten your ability to maintain your livelihood. Right? So if you're sharecropping or if you're um, in the area just trying to make a living, you're not going to be able to do that under these Jim Crow laws, which are um, a reaction to the idea that Black people would be able to participate in the franchise and um, a pointed intentional uh, effort to prevent uh, this entire population from voting. And in this instance, for almost a century. What I'm seeing here um, in my state in uh, to 2021 is the fact that um, our state turned blue in November. Uh, the Democratic Party won both the presidential seat and the Senate runoff. So um, all of those offices went to Democrats. We have a um, GOP led state. <clears throat> and in response to the fact that the laws that were in place did not result in the electoral outcomes that our leadership was interested in, uh, our state legislators have designed very similar tactics as Jim Crow laws, again, reactionary and intentional with real thought about uh, how to get at particular populations. I would say that we're talking about a wider group of people. Uh, black voters are very important, obviously, but also young voters, older voters, all of these are demographics that tend to vote Democratic. So you're sort of doing a twofer where you are getting this racial impact, but that racial impact also has a partisan impact. And of course, um, I try to encourage people to understand that these things have collateral damage as well, right? So it's not just Black voters who are going to be injured um, by the SB202 uh, New Georgia voting laws. Um, we're talking about removing. Um, time to for absentee balloting, which obviously was very effective in the 2020 election, making it more difficult to get those ballots by increasing the voter ID responsibilities um, to both apply for an absentee ballot and to actually mail your ballot in. Um, it remains the case. I mean, we were dealing with voter ID laws before this um, more, I would say like this Trump phase of the um, current voter fraud and voter suppression um, era that we're in. And um, so, you know, um, it means people having these strict IDs in a state like Georgia and getting state issued IDs if people don't already have them in order to do this thing where you actually have to mail your ID in, which I think is problematic uh, for privacy. We're talking about um, not being able to get absentee ballot applications in the mail unless they're solicited. So last year, you know, they were coming to the house. I guess some people complained, but it made it very easy to make sure that you could actually cast a ballot. Um, 
no more mobile voting units. About 11,000 people voted at mobile units um, in Georgia. Um, I observed all the elections and these were also helpful when the polls were having problems like machine breakdowns or um, just issues that weren't allowing people to actually cast ballots inside. Um, early voting has been shortened. Um, and we know that you know it's important for people to be able to take off of work, to go in to vote. They need to be able to access the polls. Um, and this was effective in November, June, and um, in, in December, but that's not necessarily gonna be available anymore. Oh, I forgot to mention with the absentee ballots, the drop boxes are gonna be severely limited and also time limited. So you can only use a drop box during the hours when the government building or the poll um, where the drop box is located is actually open, which in my mind, to some degree defeats the purpose of having a drop box. Provisional balloting. We have a major issue here where um, there's been a lot of movement of polling places in Georgia. So I saw people showing up at the wrong polls constantly using the provisional ballot. Under SB 202, this means that those voters ballots will be rejected. They won't be able to vote at all. Um, and that's just um, problematic. One, because people either go to their early voting site, which turns out not to be the right one, or importantly, they're checking the state website and their polling location has changed or it's incorrect. So I think that's really problematic. Um, there are changes to vote counting. Importantly, they have adjusted the state board. So the uh, Secretary of State is no longer a voting member of the board. Um, the chair of the board has to be someone who has not made any political donations. I realize I've made some myself, not that they'll be asking me to be on the state election board, but it disqualifies me. Um, and someone who has not run for office um, in the last couple of years. Um, the legislature has the power to um, essentially take over uh, polling precincts. Um, the state legislature here and the county that I live in, Fulton County, which is, um, tends to be a Democratic county, um, is already sort of on notice um, and in an, <laughs> a negative relationship to some degree with the state board. Um, so again, um, I'm clear that Fulton County has the kind of voters that are being, uh, that the GOP is interested in uh, reducing their ability to vote. Right, so in my mind, there is a very strong corollary between what happened during Jim Crow, the kinds of intentional and reactionary legislation that was chosen, and the kind that is being used here in Georgia in SB 202. And of course, there are a plethora of other states uh, with proposals on the table like this. I'm not sure where I am with time. Um, that, uh, you know, I think make this a Jim Crow 2.0 situation, in addition to, I don't think I said this out loud, relying on a faulty premise, which is that voter fraud is a major issue, that the 2020 election was stolen, and none of this is simply true. It's repetition, it's causing us problems, um, but it simply is patently untrue. Um, so if you were to ask me if this is Jim Crow <laughs> 2.0, I would say yes. Thank you for that, Dr. Jones. Thank you. Our second panelist is Marisa Chappelle. Uh, she's an associate professor of history at Oregon State University. She teaches and writes about the 20th and 21st century US political, social policy and social movements. She's the author of The War on Welfare, Family, Poverty, and Politics in Modern America, and the co-author of Welfare in the United States, and has written for numerous scholarly and popular venues. Her current book project is ACORN, Working Class Politics in America's Second Gilded Age. So I, my job on the panel is to give a very brief history of voting and voting rights in the United States. Um, since the 15th Amendment, and I'm going to offer some parallels between past and present that I think will pick up on Adrian's presentation quite nicely. My goal really is to, to illuminate the precariousness of electoral democracy and the interrelated role of racial and class politics in limiting the democratic promise. And it's a story in three chapters. Chapter one, an era of contraction. In the half century following the passage of the 15th Amendment, white supremacist Democrats in the South 
and white middle and upper class Republicans in the North and West waged a sustained and successful effort to restrict suffrage rights. Despite some regional differences, the general motivation and methods were remarkably similar. The emancipation of 4 million African Americans in the South created a potentially rebellious rural working class, while the influx of 25 million mostly propertyless immigrants in the North and West created a vast urban working class. Native born white Americans viewed both groups as culturally, socially, and racially other, and as a threat to American national identity and social order. And in some ways they were. Working class political activism from reconstruction through World War I threatened the prerogatives of capital. In the reconstruction South, African-American voters, sometimes joined by working class whites, implemented universal adult male suffrage, created public school systems, built new infrastructure, and taxed property to fund public projects. The People's Party, or populists, built a biracial coalition capable, perhaps, of bringing the challenge to unregulated capitalism to national politics. Meanwhile, the Knights of Labor, the International Workers of the World, and various socialist formations helped workers battle for a better deal in the coal fields, on the shop floor, and in industrial communities across the country. Charges of fraud, corruption, and incapacity framed in racial, ethnic, and class terms justified nationwide efforts to reduce working class political power. An Atlantic Monthly editorial laid out the strategy in 1879. The right of voting cannot be taken away, but the subject to voting can be much reduced. In a history of the franchise in 1918, two Yale historians presented the stakes. If the state gives the vote to the ignorant, they will fall into anarchy today and despotism tomorrow. Cities and states outside the South joined their Southern partners to restrict suffrage. They adopted property, taxpayer, and literacy requirements, lengthened residency requirements, enacted cumbersome registration procedures, and shortened polling hours. Nationally, drastic immigration restriction further reduced the potential for working class political power. The exception to contraction in this era is the gradual adoption of woman suffrage, which was nationalized in 1920. Yet part of that movement's success rested on a strategic rejection of earlier demands for universal suffrage in favor of good government arguments, rooted in claims that middle-class white women would help to counteract the votes of corrupt and incompetent black and immigrant workers. Chapter two is an era of expansion. World War II and the onset of a Cold War altered the American racial calculus, prompting substantial activism and lending national urgency to the cause of civil and voting rights. Federal courts began to strip away some of the legal mechanisms of disenfranchisement. The mass mobilization of African Americans who literally put their lives on the line to defend full citizenship created a political crisis by the 1960s that resulted in a second reconstruction. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 and its subsequent reauthorizations eliminated nearly all formal suffrage restrictions and made the federal government responsible for protecting voting rights. Passed despite virulent opposition from Southern legislators who claimed the bill would lead to despotism and tyranny, the bill prohibited various tactics that states had used to disenfranchise voters. It empowered the US Attorney General to send federal observers and registrars to, the, to covered jurisdictions, and it required voting jurisdictions with a history of Black disenfranchisement to get federal approval for any future changes in statewide electoral procedures. And the act had dramatic and immediate impact. In 1959, only about a quarter of eligible African Americans were registered to vote in the South. By 1968, 68% were registered, and by 1975, the historian Alexander Kesar claims that the act's provisions had added more than 20 million voters to the rolls. Congress and the courts subsequently expanded on the Voting Rights Act's promise. In 1966 and 69, the Supreme Court ruled that poll taxes and property and taxpayer requirements violated equal protection. By the 1980s, federal courts were ruling that individuals experiencing homelessness could establish residency in public places for voting registration. In 1975, Congress extended the Voting Rights Act to cover language minorities, which required translated registration and polling materials. 
States began to liberalize voting procedures to increase access, including same day registration, vote by mail and early voting. And in 1993, after Republican filibusters during the 1980s and a Bush veto in 1992, President Clinton signed the National Voter Registration Act, better known as the Motor Voter Law, which mandated that states make voter registration available by mail and at the Department of Motor Vehicles and Public Assistance and Social Service Offices. In less than two years, the act's provision had, provisions had added an estimated 9 million new voters. And then we find ourselves back in a chapter three, a new era of contraction. This is where we are now. With motives and methods remarkably similar to a century ago, as um, Adrian Jones pointed out, by the 1990s, working class and minority voters were building momentum and campaigns to challenge the growing power of corporate capital and neoliberal policymaking. Attention to growing economic inequality was spreading and a multi-racial coalition was mobilizing to demand immigrant rights, living wage laws, and redistributive policies like universal health care. Then in 2008, Barack Obama won the presidency with a pledge to address economic inequality through progressive policies in the first presidential election in which black voter turnout was as high as white voter turnout. Conservative activists and lawmakers nationwide began to claim, against all evidence, that the United States was suffering an epidemic of massive voter fraud. They blamed paid Democratic operatives and progressive organizations for empowering supposedly ineligible low-income voters. The justification for contracting voting rights is also eerily similar to that of a century ago, though perhaps, well, yeah, eerily similar. Low income and minority voters, restrictionists claim, are the source of corruption and fraud that subvert the democratic process. By the 21st century, conservative activists and legislators, heavily backed by corporate funding, had developed a powerful campaign to contract working class and minority voting rights. Organizations like the Voting Integrity Project, created in 1996, trained poll watchers to challenge would-be voters at the polls, spearheaded efforts to remove supposedly ineligible voters from the rolls, and lobbied for restrictive legislation. While the corporate-backed American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, developed a model voter restriction bill that Republican legislators introduced across the country. The goal was clear. States with the highest minority voter turnout were most likely to adopt new voter restrictions that disproportionately disenfranchise minority and low-income citizens. During Obama's first term, 10 states made it harder to register to vote. Many states limited early voting, particularly on Sundays and evening hours, the hours most convenient for working-class voters. 13 states adopted new voter ID laws. And in an era of mass incarceration, felon disenfranchisement affected nearly 6 million African Americans. Before 2013, court challenges and federal oversight limited the impact of some restrictionist laws because of their disproportionate impact on minority voters. But in Shelby v. Holder in 2013, a five justice Supreme Court majority invalidated preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act and opened the way to a new wave of restrictions. Um, these restrictions uh, have not gone unchallenged and will not go unchallenged. Thank you. Our third panelist is Diego Morel, who is an assistant professor of political science at Rutgers University, Newark. His research program and teaching portfolio focuses on racial and ethnic politics, urban politics, educational, and public policy. He is the author of Takeover, Race, Education, and American Democracy, and co-editor of Latino Mayors, Power and Political Change in the Post-Industrial City. He too is publicly engaged, having written a recent article in the Washington Post on the erosion of local government by state legislators. Thank you, Professor Shea. Uh, so it's, uh, it's Domingo, not Diego, just to, uh, so that way, it's okay. Um, so I, I, I wanna pick up on uh, where Professor Jones and Professor Chappelle, is it Chappelle, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, where, where they left off and talk about, um, I, I think uh, where Professor Jones left off in terms of the, the, the 
the restrictive policies related to the state takeover of uh, that a provision that's included within the Georgia law. And then where Professor Chappelle was speaking about this third chapter, because I think this is critically important. Those two come together uh, very nicely there. And so regarding SB 202, um, the Georgia law that was just uh, passed and signed uh, by the governor, uh, there, in addition to, as Professor Jones was saying, in addition to all of these uh, restrictive um, uh, uh, policies, voter suppression policies that are included within the law, there is the takeover element. And as Professor Jones was mentioning, there are two components there. One is that now the Rhode Island, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the Georgia state legislature, which is controlled by Republicans, um, now have the authority, the power to appoint a majority of members on the board of elections, right? So there are five members of the board, and now they have the, the power to appoint three out of those five. So that's a, a critical political maneuver there. And then the second part is that it the law allows the, um, the state to take over local boards of elections if they deem them as underperforming. Now, it's not clear what they mean by underperforming, but as Professor Jones was saying, uh, Fulton County, which is uh, a majority uh, community, uh, county of color, right, is already in, in the crosshairs of, of the, the uh, Georgia state legislature, right? And this is important because um, it's at the county level where most of the election decisions are made. So if there are uh, claims that there is some sort of fraud or some sort of, um, you know, um, uh, problems with voting machines or problems with, uh, you know, questioning whether people should be voting or not, it's decided at the local level, right? And so if you take the power away from the local community to make these decisions, and now these decisions are being made at the state level, we can already see the problem of, of where a Republican state uh, controlled state legislature, which has its um, incentives may collide with those incentives at the local community. And so I think this is important because it is, um, it, it, it is part of a pattern that we have seen throughout history, throughout uh, American history, where as black communities gain political power, then states begin to intervene and take away to, un to uh, undermine that political power. And we saw that I, you, in, my, in my research, I look at state takeovers of local school districts as a case to, to, to demonstrate that this is indeed what happened. And so what happened in, in the 1960s and 1970s, as ha already has been uh, laid out very nicely, we see that the Voting Rights Act, along with the Civil Rights Act and some other uh, federal legislation led to an increase in participation of African-Americans, particularly in cities. So these, these um, legislative acts were intended in uh, getting rid of Jim Crow, right? And so, but soon thereafter, we see how organizations and politicians, conservative politicians at the state level start to organize to undermine this. And so as Professor Chappelle was mentioning, organizations like the American Legislative Exchange Council, the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, these conservative organizations that were created in the 1970s built their power base at the state level. And when they're building, as they built their power at the state level, schools became a critical part of the local and state politics. School politics were the venue where marginalized communities, particularly black communities, were able to participate in the political process and gain political power. So before we saw black members on city councils or, or black mayors, which start to emerge in the 1970s and more so in the 1980s, we first saw black school board members. Not only did they get elected on the school board, but communities were fighting for resources for their schools. And so um, as they fought for resources for their schools, that became a political problem because those resources were being fought through the courts and the courts were deciding in their favor that state legislatures now had to dedicate a tax residence more to provide resources for the for these under-resourced schools with majority black communities and so that those two main factors right the increase of black political power in cities and black communities demanding more resources for their schools through the courts and actually winning 
created the political conditions for state governments who by the 1970s were becoming increasingly conservative to then uh, target schools to undermine the growth of black political empowerment. And so what I'm going to do is share my screen to show uh, in what ways this was um, politicized and very much um, uh, meant at undermining black political power. And part of the reason why this is important to note is because um, uh, uh, proponents of state takeovers of local schools have historically argued that state takeovers are not political, that they're meant to address the needs of underperforming school systems. And in my work, I, I, I show, and I hope it's convincing, that, um, that it's really not just about underperforming schools. We have uh, over 13,000 school districts in this country, however, and, and, and many of them struggle. However, the state takeover local school districts is uniquely experienced by Black communities, right? And so <clears throat> here's some... Um, Let me see if I could. I'm going to skip some of the stuff I discussed already. So here are some of the cities that experienced state takeovers. And what we see, as Professor Chappelle was mentioning, this third phase of this third chapter beginning in the 1990s, this is precisely when we see takeovers of local school districts emerge. And we see here some of these uh, cities that experienced state takeovers, many of them which are majority African-American uh, uh, cities, right, <clears throat> or at the time were. <clears throat> the other part of this too is that in order for a state to take over local schools, local school districts, the states first have to pass a law to allow that. And we see that these states are overwhelmingly passed by Republican governors and Republican-led state legislatures, the same way that SB 202 is happening and it happened in Georgia. We also find that in this incubation period, what I call an incubation period between 1980 and 2000, where state takeovers of local school districts emerged as a policy option, there were 18 states where communities won court cases to secure more resources. In 14 out of those 18 states, states passed laws to, to allow them to take over school districts. The only states the only four states out of those 18 where that where that where that did not happen were montana north dakota uh can't see here i'm sorry <laughs> um wyoming and this i can't oh here we go and vermont i'm sorry so some of the you know whitest states in the country right so average black population in these states is less than one percent right and then um equally important here i'm sorry this is not moving I apologize for that. Okay. It, equally as important here is that when states take over school districts, the school boards are treated differently, right? So there are essentially three options that states employ. Either one, they leave the local elected school board in place, right? The second option is that they abolish the locally elected school board and replace it with a state appointed board. And then the third option is that they abolish the locally elected school board and do not replace it at all. And while um, majority white school districts are less likely to experience a takeover, they do experience takeovers. But here we see what that what the, the, the effects of takeovers are on the local school board. So on the top here, we have majority white school districts that experience takeovers. In the middle, we have majority Latino districts that experience takeovers. And on the bottom, we see majority black districts that experience takeover. The blue here represents um, um, school boards that remain elected after a takeover. And the orange represents those that were abolished where and the state appointed a new board. And then the gray is where the state took over, abolished the board and didn't replace it at all. And so here we see that majority white districts get to keep their locally elected school board in roughly 70% of cases. Black, majority black school districts, on the other hand, only get to keep the elected board in around 22 or 23% of cases. The other, the other um, uh, uh, school, uh, other cases, the other percentages uh, uh, represent um, school boards that have been abolished, uh, some of them which were replaced by a state appointed board, but in most cases, and, and, and others that were not uh, replaced at all. So again, here we see the, the partisan dynamic, uh, the, the racial dynamic, I should say, related to takeovers. And then finally, I, you know, I run um, 
some models to try to um, uh, test for what are the predictors of state takeovers, right? And the two strongest predictors are A, money that's coming from the state to the local communities, and B, the um, the amount of black city council members a community has. Therefore, the the, the higher your, the, uh, the number of black city council members you have, the more likely your district is to experience a takeover. And here we see that if you have less than 5% of black city council members, for instance, the chance of you uh, uh, your community being taken over, it's very minimal. Whereas if you have 100% uh, black city council members, like many of these cities have had, then that increases to about 15% uh, 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 likelihood that your, your district will experience a takeover. So um, I'll end it here. I'll stop sharing it here. I think, you know, this is, it is important for us to, to, to think about how uh, voter suppression laws like SB 202 in Georgia are part of this, this, this um, response to the growth of Black political participation and power in cities across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Domingo. Our next panelist is Leah Varavaki, an assistant professor of American politics at Mississippi State University. Her research focuses on the study of election reforms, election administration, voter education, as well as election data, transparency, and accessibility. Her forthcoming book titled The Administration of Voter Registration, Expanding the Electorate uh, Across and Within the States, addresses the complex structure of voter registration. Her research agenda within, is within the growing field of election studies and includes three large-scale data collection projects. Welcome. Thank you, Professor Say. Uh, thank you, everyone, and so nice to be with you here all today. So um, I would like to discuss how the design of election processes can significantly increase the cost of voting for voters and can increase the burden for election administrators. So before I talk about some technical things and excuse me in advance, I want to highlight that in the election administration world, we often use the term voter centric elections, meaning that the process of voting should center around the voter. So it has to be easy, convenient, equitable and accessible. I will start with outlining some of the steps that voters must take to access elections and illustrate how some policies like Georgia's ID requirement for absentee voting can increase the cost of voting for all voters, particularly for underrepresented voters. So as we all know, except for North Dakota, all Americans must register to vote prior to casting a vote. Prospective voters must apply for voter registration, and they can do it in various ways depending on what is available in their states. So except in North Dakota, voters can register to vote using a paper form, um, either in person or by mail, and at least in 40 states they can also do it electronically with online voter registration. In some states, voters can register automatically when they get their driver's license or when they receive government services like food stamps, in some other states, voters can register to vote on election day or uh, during early in-person voting. Uh, for most voters uh, in their states, they have to register to vote between 30 days, as early as 30 days before election day, and up to 14 days from election day. It is clear, therefore, that the paths to only the first step in the election process are so different uh, and vary depending on where a voter lives uh, or how she or he opts to register to vote. The most burdensome process is having to register to vote using a paper form 30 days before an election, and that's the case here in Mississippi. Um, so considering that campaigns do their final get out the vote effort close to election day, uh, given this variation in voter registration structures, we observe that there are millions of voters who are essentially excluded from the process, they're left out, and therefore elections are not accessible to them at all because they missed that window to register to vote. Because the majority of voters drive a car or have a state ident identification, most voter registration processes are designed to ask for the specific type of information to verify a voter's identity when they register to vote. 
on the paper form, for example, voters are asked to enter their driver's license information or their state ID, or they're given the option to enter their full social security number or the last four digits of the social security number. This information, along with one's name, date of birth, mailing address, and their signature is included in one's registration record. And election officials use that information to verify someone's identity prior to accepting and verifying uh, their voter registration. Now, voter registration records are maintained by state and local election officials. And those election officials are, know the name, the address, date of birth, in many states, the race and gender of the individual voter, when they register to vote, their voter history, uh, and their active or inactive status. They also know that what information a voter utilized in their voter registration form to register to vote, whether they use the driver's license, a state identification, or a social security number. The records also include a copy of the voter signature as provided on the paper form or electronically if they register to vote online. Now, once voters manage to go through these multiple steps, these, these various paths to get them registered to vote, they have to navigate through different paths in order to actually cast their vote. So they have the option to vote in person on election day, in person during early voting, uh, they can uh, vote in a vote center, they can vote uh, on their precinct, and uh, Professor Jones talked about provisional voting, which is a big challenge uh, for these voters. They can opt to vote by mail if it's available in their state, or they can cast a vote, uh, an absentee vote, using a secure drop box if it's available in their state or jurisdiction. In states where mail voting or absentee voting is allowed, voters have to request a ballot in advance. This will be sent to them once their eligibility is confirmed. The request process, therefore, is a mechanism which allows election officials to verify the identity and the eligibility of the voter. If a voter, for example, registered to vote after a state's voter registration deadline, but is a citizen and is eligible to participate, they will have uh, her absentee request denied because although she's a registered voter, she's not eligible to vote in that specific election. So because of our time is very limited, I will focus specifically on absentee and I will illustrate the challenges that voters can face, uh, particularly with Georgia's new um, version of absentee voting that requires an ident identification. So in Georgia, voter registration has significantly improved over the years. Uh, it's one of the states that allows for online voter registration uh, since 2014, automatic voter registration since 2016. So compared to other states, it is easier to register to vote in, in Georgia than it is in other, like Mississippi. For both those options, OVR and AVR, prospective voters are required to use a valid driver's license or identification number when they register to vote. If an individual doesn't have one or does not wish to use one to register to vote online, then they are instructed to print and mail the paper form uh, to their local election office. The paper form asks registrants to either enter their driver's license or state ID or the last four numbers or the last four digits, excuse me, of their social security number. So this information is asked on the absentee request form, but only the driver's license. So, and it will be matched to the voter's record uh, in order for an absentee request to be approved and an absentee ballot to be issued. According to the Georgia Secretary of State and a big story that was circulating a couple of weeks ago, uh, there are about 200,000 registered voters or 3% of all Georgia registered voters whose voter registration record does not have a driver's license or a state identification number. Instead, these voters registered to vote using the last four digits of the social security number when they registered to vote. So these non-driver license uh, identification registered voters may face higher barriers to voting absentee under Georgia's new absentee requirements. When it comes to requesting an absentee ballot, this barrier existed already because Georgia's online portal, which is still in place, only requests for a voter's identification or a driver's license. Um, on the, and the new absentee requirements ask that voters type their driver license or their ID number on the absentee envelope prior to casting the ballot or type the last four digits of their social security number. But voters who may not have a social security number or do not wish to use it will be required to include a copy of an acceptable identification. It's not clear what that means, both when requesting and returning an absentee ballot. 
So there is a notable discrepancy in the process of requesting and returning an absentee ballot that might burden these registered voters. First, they would not be able to utilize the online portal to request an absentee because they don't have a driver's license or they don't want to use it. And because they're registered to vote with a social security number. It is not clear whether the paper request form is evaluated under the same criteria namely whether a voter includes or not a driver's license. It appears that it's not, so the, the request would be denied. As a result, it appears that the only path to voting for these voters is to vote in person. And we, the Professor Jones already highlighted the challenges um, uh, for voters who, who, who either prefer or have no other option than to vote in person, especially in Georgia. So if voting in person seems like the most obvious method of voting for these voters, assuming that the absentee option is not accessible or easily accessible, it is highly likely that depending on which county in Georgia a voter resides, the in-person voting experience will be very different, particularly in terms of access to a polling place and waiting in line. Recognizing that low socioeconomic areas experience high, higher wait times, it may be that these voters live in those counties or precincts with high rates of minority voters who experience these challenges more than others. This may indicate that the non-identification or driver's license holders are predominantly minority voters and would therefore be more likely to be impacted by the new absentee requirements in Georgia. I know that Professor Hess will address the implications of such policies for the integrity of elections, but I would like to briefly say that there is robust evidence that eligible voters are left out because they do not have the resources to meet the state's requirements about voter registration and voting. And when these requirements change and the cost of voting increase, increases, then that raises concerns about equitable access to voting, potential violations of both the Voting Rights Act and the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Finally, I would like to close by saying that despite the efforts of many states, including Georgia, to restrict access to voting, there are many others who significantly strive to expand access. So we should also pay attention to which policies they try to implement, which works. And also we should reconsider what role state, the state and the federal government play in facilitate access to voting and start discussing about an affirmative right to vote rather than a reactionary. Thank you. Our final presenter is Doug Hess, an assistant professor of history at Grinnell College, where he teaches American politics and policy studies. His current research focuses on voting rights and social policy in the United States, and of particular interest to his work is nonprofit studies on how government structures influence the implementation and outcomes of policies. His work has been informed by organizing efforts for labor and human rights in Missouri, Arkansas, Florida, Washington, D.C., and Haiti. Thank you. Um, well, as the cleanup batter, although I'm not being a sportsman, I'm not sure what that actually means. Um, I I'll be quick and just make a few, perhaps somewhat unconnected points uh, on this general topic. Um, uh, first of all, uh, since the 2000 election debacle in Florida, uh, state and local election policy has become a nationalized politics once again. As people have mentioned, this comes and goes in US history. But right now we see states and state legislatures approaching election policy that's not relevant to their state as if they were some other state or just a part of some national conversation. So here in Iowa, um, we, we um, have a reputation for being a good government state, meaning that, that administration in the Northern Midwest states tends to be very um, even-handed and well-financed and well-run. And we've had very well-run elections for a long time and very large turnout. Uh, but now people are suddenly acting as if there's fraud everywhere and things need to be cracked down upon. Well, we've, we've not had any examples of that. Um, and yet people are now putting this on the agenda not because it's being brought up by local events, but because it's being brought up by national events. Um, so election law policy now has become very nationalized and very partisan um, in its orientation. Um, because of that, and because states can set these laws to some degree, as long as they don't violate the constitution or a federal law, it's possible that Congress could act, maybe not right away, given that the Senate is split 
almost 50-50, or it is 50-50, but the vice president can break a tie. Um, so it's not likely we'll see any action soon, but due to the constitution, Congress can set the rules for its own elections uh, and how those elections are run, the time, place, and manner of those elections. And that tends to give them some room to um, say quite a bit about how elections work in the US. Um, I don't know if there'll be any election reforms coming um, down the pike, um, but the Voting Rights Act uh, is something that needs to be addressed. And um, the House did pass HR1, which is a very sweeping voting election, election reform law covering everything from campaign finance to voter registration to all kinds of things. Um, whether that parts of that might get pulled out into their own bill and pass later or in the next couple of years or three or four years as a movement builds for those things. Um, this could take time, but it, but it could happen. And as states add these bizarre restrictions, um, some of these may be addressed by Congress um, to make them illegal. So just as with the National Voter Registration Act in 1990, of 1993, Congress said states can't have a deadline of more than 30 days for voter registration, perhaps Congress will pass a law saying that all states must have X number of days for early voting or must have certain procedures for requesting an absentee ballot. Now they can only do that for federal elections, but in the past when states resisted um, the National Voter Registration Act, which I first started working on back in 1994, and uh, Barack Obama was one of our attorneys on that case and in a case in Illinois for that suit. Um, uh, some states, I think um, uh, Illinois briefly and, and maybe another state said, well, we'll just implement that law for federal elections. We'll keep the state election law the way it is for, the, for us. But the public hates that because that means there's two systems they have to learn and local officials hate that because it means they have to manage two systems. So that never really has flown, but in theory, that's, um, that could be done. So uh, it takes you know, 10 years for national legislation on an area like this to, 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 to get passed, but I think we may be seeing that movement kickstarted again with HR uh, one, which passed the house, but probably has no chance really in the Senate. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention was that um, a lot of people will hear about voting fraud. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what you, why what you often hear about voting fraud is kind of like hearing about UFOs. So uh, we all know somebody somewhere who says their cousin, uncle's dog saw a UFO or something, right? So people will often say that they've seen voter fraud or they know it exists, or of course it exists. And I wanted to just talk a bit about um, why we know it, it doesn't really exist in any large numbers. First of all, in the cases where somebody has been found to commit uh, a voted illegally, it often boils down to no, no intention to be fraudulent on that person's part, but just simply mistakes that they made in understanding how the law works, or even in many cases, it comes down to senility, unfortunately. People not remembering that they voted by mail and then they go up and try to vote in person, or um, somebody not knowing um, out of ignorance that they can't vote because of the form and former felony conviction and they haven't felt the paperwork to get their rights back to vote, which in many states can be a very, very confusing process. So in general, people who have voted illegally did not intend to, that was not an intent to commit fraud. Therefore, it was a mistake, not voter fraud. Secondly, this happens so rarely, it, it has no real um, potential to impact any election. If I did want as a voter to organize some sort of large scale voter fraud of people voting twice, like you know, I go vote with my beard, then I shave my beard off and try to go vote again or something, or go vote in another county, um, consider what my motive would be. Um, I would have to organize so many people to do that before I could have an impact on an election that that I would have to be crazy. I, I mean, I, the, the, the cost to me uh, of getting caught could be up to 10 years um, or uh, a very, very large fine for the federal violation, let alone maybe state law. Um, and so what would be in it for me to try and do all that work just for the rare chance of influencing an election? There's, there's no motive, there's no cost benefit equation here that makes sense for a person, right? Uh, you may get caught 
um, doing many criminal things, but still do them, but usually because there's some benefit um, that you see in it. Um, secondly, or thirdly, um, we know there's, there's very little fraud because if anybody organized fraud on a large scale like that, somebody would squeal. We, we, we would know, we would see evidence of it. Unusual things would show up in the data. Um, if there are millions of fake votes being cast, they, we, we would know from the data. Things would show up that, that look weird um, and they rarely do. Now we have a huge election system. So things do show up that look weird just out of uh, uh, the oddity and the pro of probabilities but um, those can be usually explained with further investigation. And this further investigation I wanna mention as a part of sort of the UFO analogy is that of course, people see a weather balloon at night and it's lit up weird and they think it looks like an alien spaceship that makes local TV news and some headlines. Um, what doesn't make the news is that a month later they figure out that it wasn't a weather balloon or something strange. So many states, people will promote some advocacy groups will do this, uh, unfortunately. Occasionally some election officials will do this. They'll promote stories of 10,000 people registered twice on the voter rolls in our state or 5,000 non-citizens registered in our state. And as uh, the court system or prosecutors or journalists or advocacy groups pick through that data and boil it down to, in fact, it's not 10,000, it was three or whatever, uh, that's not news, and, and so no one hears about that fact. So I'll give you um, one example of that, or two examples of that. Uh, one was, uh, I spoke to an attorney once who was tracking down these stories until he got tired of it, because they always turned out to be false, uh, was an example of a dead person voting. So a, in a state where you have to sign in to vote, a person who had signed in uh, next to their name uh, had died the year before. So this clearly seemed like somebody fraudulently voted for that person. Well, it turns out that person's son had the exact same name. And so when they went to vote at the precinct where their father used to vote, um, they were said, okay, sign your name here. And so they signed their name there, but that was their dad's slot, not their slot. Therefore, it looked like their dad had voted from the grave. Um, there were all kinds of stories like that. People who were accused of not being citizens because they were on a list, but the list was old and the person had become a citizen in the meantime. Uh, people who look like duplicate registrations, but you'd be amazed as to, and even in a small state, how many people have the same name or how many, how many people have the same initials and share the same birth date. Um, just numerically, um, these things pop up, but they aren't what they seem. So, uh, always uh, take it with a grain of salt any story you hear about voter fraud. If somebody tells you they've seen it, say, great, call this, call, call them, report it. Did you report it? Why didn't you report it? That's your duty, you should report it. You wouldn't get in trouble, just report it. Uh, they never do. Uh, these things never pan out. Um, finally, I, I wanna talk a bit about just one uh, theme that I've been working on recently and that needs more mentioning is that even ac uh, academics and people with good intentions often portray access to voting as if it was a policy trade-off to voting sec election security, right? Now, of course, if you go to ridiculous lengths, that's true. If we just like threw blank ballots all around the neighborhood <laughs> for people to have access to ballots, or I said, come on in, vote whenever you want. If you look 14, you can vote, go ahead, who, who cares? Uh, if we extend access that insanely wide, which no one's suggesting, then yes, that could lead to a lot of problems with election integrity. But in fact, allowing people to vote when it's convenient, uh, making sure people are registered and promoting voter registration, um, not too aggressively cleaning voter lists because you might mistakenly kick people off who shouldn't be kicked off. Um, those things increase election integrity by making sure that more people can vote, that any fraudulent votes that are out there will get washed out due to that. And by expanding access to voter registration, for instance, you clean list. So Americans move a lot. Um, in census surveys, if you ask somebody, an adult citizen, did you live here at this address last year? About 11 to 12% will say no. That's pretty phenomenal. So Americans move a lot. Um, therefore, voter registration lists become dated very quickly. Right? Um, so if you provide more opportunities to voter registration, in other words, increase opportunities to register to vote, 
people will correct that list and update that list. Therefore, the list will become self-cleaning. Now that won't remove people who've passed away or um, um, who've lost their right to vote, um, but it will catch people who've changed their name due to marriage or divorce or some other reason. It'll catch people whose name was maybe misspelt in the previous um, um, uh, voter registration list. And it'll catch people most importantly who've moved. So on the other hand, trying to increase election security can reduce integrity of elections. In other words, if we're too aggressive about cleaning voter registration list, and somebody who's on a list in Florida but, but has moved to Alaska is not gonna be voting in Florida, right? This, isn't, this is almost never happens. Uh, very, 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 very rare. The word rare doesn't even capture how rare it is. Um, but if we, if we overzealously clean list or crack down on hours or say you can only vote three days before the election or on election day and reduce access to uh, absentee voting, we are in fact um, uh, introducing discrimination. Um, we are uh, by overzealously cleaning list, we are throwing people off who should be left on because they sound like or look like uh, somebody else or just a glitch in the database causes us to throw them off. That's been shown to happen um, far more often than catching people who shouldn't be on if we're, not, if we're not careful, very careful with what we do. So reasonable attempts to improve access, which have been shown to work and have been shown to be introduced safely, uh, increase security, overzealous attempts and just simply rhetorical flourishes about election integrity that do not um, safeguard access actually hurt integrity. And in fact, I'll just close by pointing out that last year we had the stress test, uh, the, the mother of all stress tests for elections was last year, right? And election officials stepped up and did a beautiful job. And we had uh, the highest turnout we've had in almost, almost 100 years, uh, turnout rate. So if you really care about election security, election integrity, get your state to fund elections properly. Um, we add a couple million adult citizens every year in the United States. We're a fast growing country. Election officials are constantly being asked to do more with the same amount of money or even less money. So if you really care about it, uh, election integrity, expand access, and increase funding for elections. Thank you. I want to take a moment to thank our panelists for their sharp, insightful, and informed uh, comments. Uh, for the audience, uh, this panel is for you. And so please uh, tap on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and go ahead and submit your question uh, to the panelists. While you're thinking of questions and to buy a little time, uh, I'd like to ask the panelists, prior to the 2020 election, it seemed like there were four kind of key categories that uh, people were focused on when it was they were discussing how easy was it to vote in the United States. And it was voter identification, voter registration, felony disenfranchisement, and then early voting, right? And, and making those accessible would expand the suffrage. Um, what trend since the election would you like to highlight for students and members of the public kind of to keep an eye on going forward as they're interested in following this topic over the next uh, few years before the 2020 election? Yes, Leah, go ahead. I can take a stab at it. Um, yeah. So uh, if we are to compare some of the efforts that some states are doing with what the what HR1 aims to do as a first step is making uh, voter registration more accessible, particularly in those states where it is very hard to register to vote, like in Mississippi. So same day registration and online voter registration. And I wholeheartedly agree with what uh, Professor Hess was saying. 
making voter registration more accessible and more uh, modern minimizes errors in the voter records and that uh, increases the integrity of the process and secures the voter uh, when they try to vote either in person or absentee. So moving forward, there are efforts to expand access with same day registration and, uh, and online voter registration. But there, there are also a few states, Connecticut is one of them, who are actively trying to scale back uh, with some um, same day registration. And the argument behind that is to make it a more less burdensome for administrators to manage voter records. So there might be a discussion where we shift from, uh, we add another dimension to the debate, access integrity, but also administrative burden, uh, because our admittedly election officials have to manage this list and print them and prepare for election day. So where is the, the line between how accessible we can make elections and how much we ask from administrators. So as a first step, I would, I would say voter registration. Um, and I think a, a new trend uh, that has opened up many possibilities for access is the, the, the vote center model. It's not really a new trend, but the vote, um, the, um, I'm sorry, the drop boxes, which are secure and they're very convenient. Unfortunately, they have been subject to a lot of partisan debates, but, but as an administrative um, solution, it's very simple, very convenient and very secure, albeit very expensive. Thank you, Professor Maravaki. Did anybody else want to comment? Well, I'll just say that that for things coming down the pike, is this, this is what you're asking, things that new trends we might see. Uh, I think a lot of states are still um, experimenting with uh, what they've been calling automatic voter registration, which is not really automatic. So in, in many uh, wealthy countries, wealthy democracies, but not even necessarily wealthy ones, but moderate income to upper income democracies. Um, you know, governments have lots of information on the public. Um, and uh, from that database, they can develop a voter registration list, at least a first pass at, pass at it, that can be very, very accurate. Now, of course, people need to still have some access to that list to make sure it's corrected and up to date. Um, but essentially the government registers you instead of you having to go to the government to get registered. The government registers you and then you additionally, perhaps the party does this also or other groups do this, double check to make sure you weren't left off or placed at your old address or whatever, um, or they didn't get, catch your name change. So um, the US doesn't do that. Um, so some states are now working with trying to automate some lists governments have um, so that when you go to the DMV or if you apply for social services, um, that you'll be sort of automatically registered to vote. They're still working the kinks out. Each state's doing that a bit differently that's been playing with that. Um, it's in HR1, but I'm not, I don't remember the details of it. So that could be coming down the pike, uh, I think. Um, a thing that was done here in Iowa, maybe some other states might have done this, is to en encourage people to use absentee balloting during the pandemic was the state sent to people an application for absentee balloting to you already filled out. Now you just had to like sign your name and maybe check a couple other things, but the information was there. The form could be used rapidly, which probably does, does increase response rates. That really angered a lot of state legislators and that's um, uh, been, been uh, rolled back. And if a county official now tries to do that without permission from the state, um, they can be fined or jailed even. So they've actually criminalized administrative offenses by election officials in Iowa, which is, which is just insane. Um, and, um, but this issue of using list better and using direct marketing better by government to facilitate voting and make elections more vote centric as, um, Professor uh, Miravaki was saying, um, I, I think we'll keep saying some adjustments in, in that area. Um, a lot of your uh, discussion has been at the federal level and we had a question dealing with state level policies. Are there particular states where you're concerned about them viewing Georgia as a model and pursuing reforms that Georgia has presented? Yes, Dr. Jones. 
Yes, um, I would pay attention to states that are controlled 100% by the GOP, um, like Arizona and South Carolina, Florida, it's Mississippi, um, perhaps. Um, and then Nobody I would, cares about Mississippi, so. I would know. keep swing okay. states in mind. You know, um, Iowa did just pass a, a, a bevy of laws. Um, you know, I'm concerned about Michigan, Florida. Um, I mean, these are states to pay attention to, even if they're not gonna pass the incredibly egregious <laughs> slate of bills that we have. Um, I also said no to the pay attention piece because I think of the categories, but I think you should be paying attention to um, different ways to vote, right? New York's about to use ranked choice voting. Um, I think that we need to be thinking about different methods of ex executing the vote because there can be more power in your one vote, right? If you're able to rank choice vote or proportional or, you know, there are a couple different processes. I'm not an expert on that, although I'm trying to become one. Um, because you know the single, the single person ballot, um, you know it doesn't get the kind of mileage that is possible uh, for ballots that I think would make a difference for people, and is becoming of interest. Yes, Dr. Morrell. Yeah, I would just uh, like to add to that uh, that while Georgia is getting all of the attention now, right? Uh, because yeah, obviously these draconian measures, uh, for the last decade or so, it's been building, right? And so the states of um, Texas, right, uh, North Carolina, they've passed um, these voter suppression bills over the past, into 2013, 2014, 2015, and um, many of them have been challenged in the courts. And so I think it's an ongoing process. And um, so we need to think about it as, you know, Georgia is not new. Georgia, Georgia has been building on other states, and we can anticipate, as Professor Jones was saying, about how some other states are going to model that as well. <clears throat> uh, question. If Congress passes the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, would it invalidate some of these restrictive state laws, or would they still need to be challenged through the legal system? And just uh, what are, for our audience, what are the provisions that are kind of in that John Lewis Voting Rights Act uh, that would give more access and uh, verify voting as a right? So um, I stay focused on Georgia and I'm not, um, do not have the provisions of HR1 at my fingertips, but my, uh, sense is that it is a nationwide applic nationally applicable law that's going to do some streamlining um, like Professor Miravaki mentioned. Um, and then uh, Professor Hess was pointing out that perhaps you could have some, you know, blanket rules about um, some of these methods, you know, how registration works, how early voting works, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a good idea for all of us to drill down um, into the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. So to the other person, um, Ms. Collinger, there is a new Voting Rights Act. Um, I would also say that part, while the Voting Rights Act originally was in force, one of the things that people did not want was for it to be a national provision because it weakened it in some ways that are very important. And so the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, while fantastic, is not, exact, it won't be a return to the kind of protection that we were getting. And the protection wasn't foolproof. Obviously, we did run into this voter ID and now this voter suppression um, in a mo more full blown basis. Um, however, during the period of time that it worked, I think that states, even Georgia eventually, um, used the process and even other states that were not covered sort of had a moral expectation of themselves that they would act correctly during elections. Um, and this has eroded, uh, you know, since 2000 as a result of this GOP initiative. Um, but, you know, 
I continuously return to not being a person who studies religion to this idea that we need a religious change in the United States about voting, about access, about other people's citizenship um, that I don't quite know how we're going to get um, because it's not just, you know, as Professor Morrell is explaining that, you know, Black political power means a loss of Black political power. Um, you know, none of that goes away until people actually grow out of accepting these divisions as appropriate and, nat and natural, I guess is the best way I could put it. Um, so I want you to take away that this is a Jim Crow II situation um, and that you need to encourage yourself and others to um, you know, revolutionize your thinking about ourselves and other people. And along those lines, it seems as though there has been somewhat of a revolution while people have been focusing on limiting, uh, particularly conservatives, on limiting the power of the national government. It does seem like in state governments that the state legislatures have taken, uh, what I wanna say, have, have taken liberties with uh, taking control over local elections as uh, Professor Morell mentioned. And I wondered if there was anything on the national stage that would protect local communities against that kind of overreach that you were talking about from state legislatures? Well, so, so the courts are one, one way to do this, right? But this is why the courts matter all across, you know, the, the, the federal system at the district level, the appeals level and the Supreme Court. As long as you have um, a Supreme Court um, makeup like we have now, it is very unlikely that we're going to see successful challenges that reach the Supreme Court um, 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 make decisions in favor of expanding voting rights, right? That's why the conversation now about whether, you know, to expand the court is a very critical one, right? So, um, so that is the that's the mechanism for local communities to fight against these state legislative um, actions is through the courts because they are um, they don't have the power to fight the states in this and so that the courts become critical here and so I just want to add that that it it it, uh, it brings attention to the importance of the courts particularly the Supreme Court and the conversation that we're having now where Biden just announced a committee to um, examine the idea of expanding the Supreme Court, which is an important part of this, this broader story here. If I may add to that, um, on the opposite side, uh, it appears that a good strategy for state legislatures uh, are to go, is to go through the court system to challenge uh, if HR1 or HR4 uh, becomes federal law. Um, it is an obvious strategy to challenge in the court setting um, that, you know, the 10th Amendment and the, the, the Constitution, based on the Constitution, states are in charge of elections. Um, and with the makeup of the Supreme Court, um, it might invalidate key parts of it, as we saw with um, in Shelby v. Holder. So that is a major um, weakness um, in this design that we have in, on, in how elections are run. Um, so no matter how good um, these policies may be because they they level the field across all the states for voters to access we can still have pushback from the states uh based on what the constitution says but also that that can lead to different processes across every state on how they are to implement these rules and we have seen evidence of that with voting rights act with the nvra with the Help America Vote Act, which is why an enforcement mechanism, as Professor Jones was saying, that the Voting Rights Act, the New Voting Rights Act is necessary uh, because states will always find ways to, always find loopholes um, on how they want to run their elections that can have negative consequences for voters. I talked to an Australian outlet recently and they asked me, he said, you know, we have compulsory voting and it's on Saturdays. You know, can't you guys do that? And I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> that would completely <laughs> ruin <laughs> the whole plan here. Like, you know, we've spent uh, over a century in this uh, voter suppression, <laughs> voter fraud environment. Like that would just, you know, <laughs> change the whole 
US <laughs> to tell you. Um, but I was, you know, I haven't studied Australia. And so I was heartened to hear that, uh, you know, compulsory voting does exist. You can go to jail if you don't vote. Um, and then the voting is on Saturday. People are expected um, to show up and it's scheduled for a day when they can actually do such a thing. Yeah, and reform said, oh, go ahead. Thank I'll you, say, Dr. I, I, think, I think Argentina also has compulsory voting, but in, in, in those countries, um, if you don't vote, it's at most usually a small fine or a small loss of some benefit um, because there is this sense that not voting could be a form of expression too. Um, but um, I, I think tying uh, voting to necessity and understanding of its impact on you, as we saw in 2020, even during a pandemic, um, is uh, important. And we've seen, been seen, we've seen some increases in youth turnout uh, since 2000 at different points. And that, that's a, an area where there's still lots of room to grow. Same with low-income voters. Those are sort of the two groups that need the most growth to catch up, to equalize things, um, as well as state laws that um, uh, undermine um, men of color's right to votes due to the carceral state we live in. Um, I think those are the areas where we could see the most action for, for turnout um, that uh, still need some state policy change unless there is some, again, room for federal law or a constitutional amendment um, that could more clearly outline what voting rights entail. A lot of people are surprised to learn that there is no voting right in the US Constitution. Um, it's implied in a lot of places, and there are amendments to the Constitution that say states cannot do this to your voting rights due to former servitude or color or age or gender. Um, but there is no explicit right to vote in the Constitution. Now, the Supreme Court has often said the right to vote is a fundamental right. Um, so a lot of people have not worried about this too much, but I think recently some people have come around to the argument that perhaps we should have a voting rights amendment to the Constitution uh, uh, for some uh, particular legal reasons um, and uh, some uh, enforcement needs, um, allowing Congress to more aggressively enforce these laws federally. Um, uh, we've spent much of our discussion talking about uh, kind of the political aspect here. But I did want to venture outside of that a little bit, because, of course, Jim Crow was an interlocking system system that went across society, not just politics, but also was cultural, also was based on uh, social institutions. And uh, so along those lines, uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Chappelle, what is the role of corporations, uh, large businesses in this process? And do you find it interesting that corporations have found themselves in the middle of this debate in maybe a little different way than what they had expected? It was interesting when I first, um, you know, when when the Senate bill in Georgia first went through and I was, uh, people were saying, where are these corporations who, when the bathroom bill went through, right, spoke out and said, no, we can't tolerate this. And it, it gives you, right, it makes it, it, it makes bare um, the fact that a lot of American corporations um, for their brand, right, advocate um, tolerance and multiculturalism, right, um, and even anti-racism, right, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, but, but, but they don't, corporations don't have an interest in expanding voting. They simply don't because of the history I, I, I was talking about and the reason that the GOP wants to limit voters. They wanna limit voters because if you look at opinion polls, the vast majority of Americans don't agree with the program that the far right is trying to promote. They simply don't. So if you have democracy, that program won't win, right? And you see that all the way back to reconstruction that lower income voters and BIPOC voters are generally going to support a more redistributive state, right? Uh, a more regulatory state, um, limits on corporations, limits on capitalism, union rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I think that's where, and, and, and corporations um, are part of who is funding 
right? These candidates who is funding these campaigns, funding these um, uh, think tanks and other organizations that are that are pushing this voter suppression movement. I was just interested because um, it seems like when corporations did step up to speak out in favor of democracy that somehow the liberals owned the NFL for the first time in a long time and Major League Baseball and the NBA, right? And, and even the NHL, right? Um, because uh, it seemed like this attempt was so egregious. And so perhaps there is a little bit of cracking there, uh, if not a full, full fledged support. Um, I observed that we are on at the end of our time, and I just wanted to give our uh, wonderful panelists an opportunity to say anything that they wanted to uh, that we hadn't covered or something that they thought uh, they wanted to share with the students of Oregon State. I'll start, I'll say real quickly, um, democracy is participatory. <laughs> you cannot take for granted um, democracy and your rights. So um, it's incumbent upon all of us to, to do something, to act, to support social movements, to promote voting rights. I echo the sentiment and um, I, I'm not sure if my, my assumption would be correct that most uh, students that attend this panel today are political science students. But there are ways to mobilize and uh, help uh, your fellow classmates or peers to, to vote, uh, organize registration drives on campus, um, reach out to other fields, uh, because we know that um, st the STEM fields, um, other fields are not as uh, represented. They don't vote as much as political science students or social sciences. So there are opportunities to um, engage on campus and um, students should take advantage of that. and and in, involve everyone on campus and, and create a space uh, that where students are civically engaged and that should be part of every university's mission statement that students are involved and they vote and they help their peers register to vote. Yeah, I echo that too and um, would like to uh, answer Kara's question. Um, she asked a question about have local communities been able to regain local control after the state took over? And so I think right along with what has been said already, communities have been able to regain control of local schools, but not because it was given to them, but because they fought for it, right? So in places like Newark, where I'm at, in Philadelphia, in Oakland, and some of these other uh, communities, they fought for it and they, they organized at every single level. And so I think that's the lesson that um, organization is the key, participation is the key, and and you know that's important, particularly for the young folks um, to 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 get involved with. So yeah. <clears throat> well, I'll, I agree with all of that that's been said, and I'll just add that um, don't forget about local politics and state politics. Uh, it's too easy for people to focus on the national news and the national politics. But often it's it's your state politics that has a bigger impact on your life or even your county or your city. Um, so stay involved in those uh, uh, political uh, stories as well. Often because there's low participation in local elections, by getting involved, you can in fact have a very large impact. Um, I encourage students uh, who want to get involved in politics to also, if there are classes in policy studies, which is my field, um, to look into policy classes so you can uh, learn how to analyze problems and uh, write to recommend uh, write recommendations for policy changes or policy um, um, uh, advocacy of some kind. Um, so consider those fields. I feel like I've spoken um, significantly. <laughs> I wanted to say that, you know, Georgia is historically a voter suppression state. Um, you know, I could talk for an hour about our history of just consistent voter suppression. Um, but in the last decade, especially, um, we've had a number of organizations. Stacey Abrams is a good, um, you know, front person for what I'm talking about who are mobilizing voters. Um, and to my colleagues' suggestions about you being involved in local and state politics and elections and even stuff that's close to your house, church, um, et cetera. Um, you know, with that kind of 
community action, you know, will be able to <laughs> successfully participate in elections in Georgia, even though there are these roadblocks. Um, so I would urge you to try to stay um, focused and optimistic that, you know, if the rules are changing and if these are bad changes, um, you know, you can think creatively about what to be doing in order to mobilize around um, some of these problems until we're able to, you know, bring the law and our, you know, social environment back to where we'd like it to be. Um, so ultimately, um, I'd encourage uh, everyone here to participate in those kinds of efforts. I would I like to thank, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I just want to thank say one, one last thing because unfortunately, this, the discussion about election and voting policies has been framed as you know voter suppression um, or expansion, but we should all be pro-voting. It's something that ha should have no partisanship on it. So no matter you know which party, students or anyone uh, supports, take a good look at these policies and think about how they impact voting. And yeah, we do find that they impact minority voters who tend to vote Democratic more, but they will they also impact voters who vote Republican. They impact all voters. So we should be opposed to any policy that places restriction on voters, period. We should not be thinking about who is more likely in terms of partisanship. So voting should have no, no party. Um, so focus on how can we help everyone participate um, before we think about, uh, about an, in partisan uh, ways? That's the last thing. <laughs> I think that's the perfect note uh, to end on. Uh, to our audience, thank you so much for attending. Uh, the health of our society is dependent on conversations like these to expand and extend our understanding of these issues. And especially a thank you to the panelists for their wonderful uh, leadership in this conversation on the voting challenges and how we will march forward to our shared destiny um, and uh, wish you all the best of luck and thank you for attending.